Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, maybe good evening. Depends where are you. And uh, so my name is Martin Machung, uh, and I am the CEO and co-founder of the Lifeline Diag Laboratory from Europe, uh, which specializes in uh, elemental hair analysis. And uh, I welcome uh, all of our international partners to the training session about uh, elemental hair analysis tests. Uh, today's meeting is the result of our cooperation with the uh, Indian Association of Functional Medicine. And uh, thanks to this, uh, we can discuss the idea of our tests with our This meeting is being recorded from uh, India. For this reason, one of the moderators, well, one of the hosts of uh, today's meeting uh, will be Dr. Anish Musa. Dr. Musa is a functional medicine practitioner. Uh, certified by the Institute of Functional Medicine in the US. Uh, he did uh, MBBBS and MS from University uh, Vadodara, uh, Gayurat. He's also certified international, uh, internationally in the field of, uh, of ophthalmology, thyroid, and integrated medicine. Uh, he has more than 20 years of clinical experience and he's keenly interested in research and uh, reversal of chronic disease through the functional medicine approach. Uh, the second host uh, is John uh, Bumpus from uh, Australia. Uh, he is a heart tissue mineral analysis practitioner and uh, natural medicine practitioner that uh, specializes in mineral balancing science and uh, natural detoxification. And John will uh, tell us about the details of the uh, heart tests and the ways of its uh, interpretation. He is a senior fellow of the Society of Natural Therapists and Researchers and founder of the Mineral Balancing Academy. Uh, today's uh, meeting uh, has two parts. The first one, uh, it will be a lecture about the test uh, that will be reversed by John. And the second part, uh, the Q&A session, uh, will be moderated by Dr. Musa. So I'm sure that it will be very valuable uh, meeting for all of us. And uh, let's start. John, it's a great honor to have you uh, on today's meeting and please start your presentation. Thank you. Very, very much appreciated. And uh, thank you, everyone, for gathering today because we have a lot in store. Um, I'm just wondering if I can share my screen, maybe, and I can show slides. Thank you. I imagine you guys can see the presentation now. <laughs> okay, cool. All right, so um, welcome again, everybody, for coming. Uh, thank you to the uh, Indian Association of Functional Medicine and Lifeline Diagnostics for um, bringing this presentation together and making it available to you guys. Um, we have a lot to cover today, so hopefully it doesn't seem too overwhelming, but um, if you really need to, we will be sending the slides out to you guys as well, if you feel like you need them. Um, so I guess I should tell a little bit about me. Um, Marcin already did a wonderful introduction, but um, it pretty much covered everything. The only thing I'd like to add is that we also do a, a, a free podcast that's available on YouTube. Um, it's called the Mineral Minded Podcast, where we kind of specialize um, in talking about natural detoxification, but also um, natural medicine and hair tissue mineral analysis. And we try and gather a lot of practitioners in this field so that we can have a chat about, um, you know, our per unique perspectives together. Now, um, today we're going to be talking about elemental hair analysis. And if um, we're going to talk about it for those that might not be aware of what it is. I guess I should explain what it is. So elemental hair analysis is a functional screening test that measures the um, 
the nutrients and toxic elements that are present in a hair sample. And it indicates a lot of um, potential health issues and nutritional imbalances by pinpointing different element levels and ratios where it matters the most, which is the cellular level. Now, an elemental hair analysis is the term that Lifeline Diagnostics uses, um, and I will use it in this presentation, but if you do search a, a little bit more online, you'll find that people also use the term hair tissue mineral analysis or HTMA. But I want to be clear that elemental hair analysis, HTMA, they are the same thing. So uh, just so you guys know if you feel like you're going to do further research after this presentation. Now, there are many different ways to read and interpret an elemental hair analysis, um, but they're not all the same. There's a couple of different camps on how to um, interpret this test, but I will say that just because they have a difference in interpretation doesn't mean that they produce the same results clinically. Um, but when you use uh, an elemental hair analysis through the mineral balancing perspectives, we can reveal at a simple glance, sometimes quicker than you would expect, especially if you have some experience with this test, um, a large amount of um, valuable clinical information that um, can relate to both physical and mental health. We won't get too much in detail uh, as far as mineral balancing in this presentation, but I will say that um, the, a lot of the information we're going to be talking about today was originally developed in the United States by Dr. Paul Eck and Dr. David Watts in the 1970s and 1980s. So there's over 50 years of experience and interpretation and what these values mean and the information that comes up from it. Now, in my opinion, it does take several years of experience to really get comfortable using this test, um, at least to get the full uh, gamut of what this test can offer. But my goal in this presentation is to really give you some information that you can start to use now clinically, as well um, as kind of get a taste for the full potential of hair testing. Now, the data from an elemental hair analysis, when properly interpreted, can offer really important insights into um, tissue nutritional status and imbalances. This includes excesses and deficiencies. Uh, we can also see not just um, overt deficiencies, but we can see relative deficiencies, which is a unique um, and forthcoming area of nutritional science. We can also get an idea about tissue um, heavy metal burdens or toxicities, and hair testing itself is often um, used for this uh, purpose when most people use it, um, but it's only one aspect of the use of a hair tissue mineral analysis or an elemental hair analysis. We can also get a lot of insights into energy and vitality at the cellular level, uh, nervous system activity, whether it's the parasympathetic activity of the um, autonomic nervous system or the sympathetic activity, and we can uh, assess which dominance these individuals are experiencing um, over a period of time. Get insights on glandular function, primarily adrenal, but also thyroid. And this isn't blood thyroid test. This is a cellular level. So we'll get into this a little later, but it's not necessarily always the same. We can get insights on blood sugar regulation, digestion, and immune compromisations. And this is really unique because you don't always have to test which microorganism you're dealing with. You can get many insights on, with just a hair test. And we have also mentioned in the past already about psychological health, and there's really a lot more that you can also assess, but we'll just try and keep it onto one slide today. So generally, the information that's provided by an elemental hair analysis is used to uh, identify metabolic trends. Um, but it can be used in addition to other tests, especially if you're a licensed uh, physician, which I, I know at least the Indian Association of Functional Medicine in this that are sitting in are in this situation, you can use a hair test in addition to other tests for diagnostic or, or trying to identify different diagnostic um, criteria. 
Now, it's not necessary to be a physician to use elemental hair analysis to help your clients. Uh, mineral balancing practitioners, for example, oftentimes use an elemental hair analysis within the scope of what they've trained uh, in, um, but they'll often use it to provide nutritional supplementation or lifestyle counseling, and also maybe other modalities such as chiropractic and stuff. They might integrate this testing as well in their practice. And um, with all this being said, um, when a mineral balancing practitioner does get faced with um, a situation that's a little bit more advanced or outside of their scope of practice, they usually refer that client to a licensed health professional. So it's very important for these licensed health professionals to have an understanding about what hair testing is so we can be somewhat on the same page. Now, elemental hair analysis provides uh, really important information on the state of health at the tissue level um, and even the cellular level. And this is unique information that's not normally found through other forms of testing like blood, urine, or saliva, this sort of thing. Um, it includes um, some specific conditions that are um, somewhat difficult to evaluate otherwise as well. So as we've mentioned before, there's obviously the heavy metal burdens, but also like tissue copper status, because blood testing for copper is actually not that accurate, whether you're looking at serum copper or even ceruloplasmin. Um, it's kind of not the best test. It's, it's actually really poor um, testing copper status in the blood. We can also look at things like um, advanced aging or calcification and chronic fatigue and chronic exhaustion, which is becoming somewhat of an epidemic nowadays. And as I've already um, mentioned, the tissue thyroid status. So it's somewhat invaluable in that um, its capacity to move the needle for those chronic health conditions that are oftentimes very difficult to improve otherwise, because it gives you insights that you wouldn't normally get from typical testing. Now, as a screening test, elemental hair analysis um, has enough value kind of as a sole means of testing. So um, you can just use this as kind of like an introduction to testing with your clients or as a sort of um, a test that becomes a gateway outwards to um, assess whether or not there's different areas that are needed for investigation. So if you did a hair test or an elemental hair analysis and you see that the thyroid ratio might indicate um, an imbalance, then it might um, help you pursue testing the thyroid at the blood levels and get a better understanding of what's going on so that you can put the puzzle pieces together. Now, um, since it's relatively inexpensive, an elemental hair analysis, when you look at other functional medicine testing, you'll also find that it can be very helpful for our uh, patients and clients because it can help them save money. And this drastically improves compliance when it comes to sticking with a practitioner or a medical doctor, because um, let's be honest, cost is a major factor, especially for people that have a lot of um, chronic health issues, because usually you're not the first person they've seen. Um, and I know in my practice, I'm often like, not, maybe not the last, but <laughs> they've gone through many practitioners before they get to me. And this does affect the, you know, the client's ability to be able to comply to therapy. Um, another benefit of elemental hair analysis is that it does have a very quick turnaround. Now, once the lab receives the sample, it usually only takes a few days to get your results. Um, and this is pretty cool because I know, especially in Australia, um, oftentimes we, have, we have to send testing out to, uh, at least for a lot of the, you know, Vogue functional medicine testing to America. And it, it's very convenient that Lifeline Diagnostics, especially for me, is in Poland. Now, um, Another benefit of elemental hair analysis is that um, you can also use it to monitor patient progress. Um, and you do this by doing repeat testing. And we usually recommend that uh, clients retest their hair every three to four months. And you can use this to track progress, but then also ensure that they're taking supplements that the body still needs rather than just guessing what you need to use. So, the question obviously comes, why would we want to really test elements or even metals in the first place? And if you've ever read a book on biology or anything about a cell, you would know that 
nutritional elements especially are essential for life, we just can't live without them. And they're involved in almost every single biochemical process. And they are also essential for cofactors for other nutrients like vitamins, proteins, carbohydrates, and fats. If something happens in the body, usually you need minerals as the raw materials to kind of get the, the function going. So um, yeah, elements are the raw materials that are required um, for both the structure of the human body and as well as the function. If the function of our cells is not working in a healthy manner, then it's worthwhile to test at the cellular level to see what um, imbalances might be occurring so that we can address these imbalances and shift body chemistry to improve the function of the whole body, right? Now, a common example that I like to use is uh, comparing the body's raw materials to the raw materials of building a house. So if you do not have enough nails, screws, or even wood, you just can't finish building a house. And the same is true for the cellular function. Our body requires the raw materials, these nutritional elements for both its structure and for its function. Now, there are four primary methods for testing elements. Um, they all have advantages and disadvantages. So whole blood is the most recognized, it's the most used um, test for assessing uh, nutritional elements, but it doesn't um, provide the whole picture. It provides a snapshot of the transportation of elements to um, and from storage areas of the body. So it's only showing movement. It's not showing the nutritional status as at the tissue level. It can also provide, uh, blood at least, can provide a false indication of balance, especially when a disease is present. And this is because mineral levels are kept at a relatively constant level in the blood even when pathology is present. And this is because the body has innate mechanisms, you know, homeostatic mechanisms that buffer the blood to make sure that everything's within good balance so that you can stay alive. So this balance though is maintained at the expense of the tissues. So tissues are like a reservoir and the hair, which we're testing is also a tissue. So it does reflect that um, tissue status. Now, even if you're testing erythrocytes or red blood cells, um, this does indicate intracellular activity, but it's only limited to one cell type, the red blood cell, and it's not going to um, reflect, you know, liver cells or heart cells or any other, you know, neurological cells, for example. Um, testing urine as well is um, can be used to identify a person's tissue level but it's not always ideal since it's only showing what's being eliminated from the body. It's like um, looking at a garbage bin on the side of the road. You can't always use um, the information from inside that garbage bin to assess what is in the person's home, right? It's same as with urine, it's elimination. So it's what's leaving the body. Now it is true that to some degree you can do loading tests um, to assess somewhat nutritional status. This is things like, you know, loading iodine or boron and then testing how much is eliminated so that you can assess, um, you know, if the body's deficient, but this is somewhat controversial. Um, then of course there's hair testing. Now hair is a good analysis. Um, Hair analysis is a good indicator of metabolic processes that are occurring within the cell and also the intracellular storage of nutritional reserves. It also shows us a compilation of events that occurred over a period of time. So it's an average of metabolic activity. And to some degree, it is a, a minor excretory route. So it can indicate somewhat of what's being eliminated, but in general, it does reflect what's moving through the blood. And therefore, well, if it's in the blood, it's usually going to the tissues. So hair is beneficial for this reason. It also provides a long-term reading of what's going on. Um, so it's more of an overview of what's going on in the tissue level, while blood tests and urine tests are more instantaneous um, readings of what's going on and what's being eliminated in the body. So hair is one of the uh, most metabolically active tissues in the body, and it can provide a permanent record for metabolic activity since during its formation, it's exposed to the internal environment of the body 
um, including the blood, extracellular fluid, cerebrospinal fluid, and even the lymphatics. Now, as hair starts to make its way out, because it grows, it's not technically living, but it's growing out from the surface of the skin, um, the outer layers start to harden, and it locks in metabolic products that occurred during its formation. And those uh, metabolic products are what are coming from the bloodstream. So since hair typically grows one centimeter each month, um, and a typical hair sample is usually three to four centimeters, it can be a little bit longer. Um, but the three to four centimeter range is really good because it would show you an average of what's occurring over three to four months, and it would show you an average of that metabolic activity. Now, this makes it a really good indicator um, of recent intracellular activity and the storage um, over that time period. So elemental hair analysis is really a mineral biopsy, and hair is a really excellent tissue for this because it locks things in its keratin formation, and it can remain viable for many years. Maybe you've learned, um, you know, Mozart had his hair tested to see what elements were in there. Um, and other, you know, like Utzi, the, uh, the Iceman also had his hair tested to see what kind of elements the people would have been exposed, exposed to, you know, 10,000 years ago. And that's how stable hair is as a tissue. Blood, not so much. You need special care <laughs> to make sure that it maintains its, uh, its quality. Now, collecting a hair sample is actually really simple. And one of the benefits is that it doesn't really require a lot of special training. And you can do it in the clinic. When your client comes in for an initial intake, you can cut the hair sample there with them, with their permission, obviously. Um, and it's very simple um, to do. So it's not like you need to have certain certifications to do blood drawing, for example. It is also um, a, a, an important thing is that it's non-invasive, so it doesn't cause harm. And, you know, we make this Hippocratic oath of, you know, do no harm. So it, it's very much in tune with the Hippocratic oath. Now, um, it's also important to follow the guidelines that are offered by Lifeline Diagnostics that come with your elemental hair analysis test kit um, to make sure that you do collect the sample properly. But once you get the hang of it, you'll find it's very simple to do. Um, but the basics of it is that um, use, using hair from the, this, the head, the scalp, is the best as far as you know, your nutritional status, in my opinion, at least. Um, but the hair needs to be chemically untreated, so you don't want to have it permed or dyed or bleached. Um, if the hair is chemically treated, I usually recommend that the clients wait you know, six to eight weeks, just so that the um, new hair can grow in. And then you want to take a sample of that new virgin hair. Um, and this is so that you can provide a sample to the lab that doesn't have any contaminants, because to get the most of it element till hair analysis, you want to make sure that you have um, a good sample. Now, I have had clients, you know, that um, still test their hair with um, dyes, or they use um, you know, specific medicated shampoos. And sometimes it's just part of the process. You, you, you end up using it inevitably, but in general, you want to make sure you provide a nice clean sample. Um, you also need to be mindful of um, different so uh, possible sources of external contamination that can um, affect the hair. And as I said, medicated shampoos is a very uh, common contamination. Head and shoulders, for example, this brand that people often wear for um, dandruff, for example, can um, skew zinc levels on a hair test. But to be honest, I haven't really seen that too much in my practice. Um, the worst you know, contaminants are things like Selsun Blue because it's got selenium and because hair, um, the keratin, the sulfur bonds in there are cysteine rich, um, it just absorbs that selenium. So <laughs> you'll often find very high selenium levels on um, hair tests when someone uses Selsun Blue. 
Other really notorious ones are things like Grecian Formula, which um, is like a hair darkening shampoo, and Restoria is another one. And um, they use lead in the um, formation of the shampoo. For whatever reason, they say it's safe by putting lead on your hair, but it will contaminate the hair sample when you send it to the lab. Um, and, you know, like you might get a message from Lifeline saying, uh, this is very high. <laughs> so... Uh, just some things to keep in mind that it definitely can have contaminations here. Um, in general, because um, when you're doing a hair sample, you want to make sure that you do clean, dry hair. And you want to try and um, cut the sample somewhere between 4 to 12 hours after washing the hair like you typically would with just a simple shampoo. Baby shampoo works really well. Um, or even Dr. Bronner's is a brand name or some sort of um, very simple soap. Um, you don't need to use conditioner or any other hair um, product that's added to it because this is all potential sources for contamination of the hair sample. Now, the hair itself, the best place to cut it is the occipital region, you know, just right around the ear, just above there, um, on the base of the skull. And um, usually the sample length is about three to four centimeters. And this is to help provide... Um, the most recent metabolic activity that's going on with your clients. But I will say that if you um, do a recent hair sample, three to four centimeters, and you find very elevated, say, arsenic or mercury, um, then you can actually test the hair further down to confirm um, if it maybe it was just a recent exposure that they were exposed to over a three to four month period or if it was a chronic exposure that the person might be exposed to. Um, and then if you definitely find very high toxic metals, especially in someone, then you want to send um, a pubic hair sample to confirm that it's not just a con some sort of external contamination onto the scalp. Now, one of the benefits um, of using Lifeline Diagnostics is that, you know, the lab protocol really matters. So once the hair reaches the laboratory, it's important to emphasize that, um, that the labs that you use to test your hair shouldn't wash the sample. And if you do the proper um, sample um, protocol that we've mentioned, you know, using clean hair four to eight hours after um, washing it, they shouldn't need to wash it at the lab. Now, the reason for this is that um, excessive washing at the lab um, itself can wash away a lot of extracellular elements that are meant to be um, a normal, um, comp uh, they're meant to be on the hair as part of the normal composition. So this can affect things like sodium levels, but even potassium levels on the hair test. And it can, well, really, it can affect mostly electrolytes, <laughs> but um, we find, and as we go forward to when we get into ratios, you'll find that these are very important when it comes to um, the uh, assessment of an individual's health. Now, this is also important because different labs have different protocols, and some might wash it six times, some might do it eight times, some might use an acetone or Triton X or something, and the other lab won't. So the, the, there can be inconsistencies in results, which obviously causes issues um, if every lab's doing different protocols. So not washing it creates a nice level playing field for everybody to have accurate results of what the hair indicates. So um, to obtain the most, you know, important, you know, the most relevant information, um, we want to make sure that we're using samples that haven't been washed at the lab. And Lifeline Diagnostic has assured me that they don't wash the sample. So this is ideal. So if you use a Lifeline um, Diagnostic elemental hair analysis um, for your hair samples, you can use the inter interpretation information that I will be presenting today. So let's dive into some of the information to help you interpret the results of an elemental hair analysis. Now, as I mentioned earlier, it does take you know, a lot of experience to really learn all of this information. But today, I will try and cover some things that you can start to use in your practice immediately. Now, elemental hair analysis offers... I can't um, emphasize enough, very highly valuable data clinically because um, 
but it needs to be interpreted properly. If the interpretation of the hair analysis, uh, it's not always at, taken at face value. You can't always just say, oh, something's high, therefore we, we need to avoid it, or something's low, therefore we need to supplement it. It doesn't work um, so much in that way. Um, so it's not very intuitive at first. So the learning curve can be a little bit um, stark initially. But the elemental hair analysis, um, one of the things we need to make sure that we, we say is that it doesn't measure the total body content of any element. So you won't, you won't ever do a hair test and um, be able to assess, you know, the, a total mercury load for an individual or something. And really there's no test to do this unless you know you test the ash of a human um, which usually it's a little late to do a nutritional program by that point um, now it is important also to remember that the levels of the elements um, that are found in the hair are an average of what happens over a period of time so it's over that usually three to four centimeter three to four month kind of um, period of time. So every time we do a hair test, we're kind of looking a little bit into the past and using that information to shift the person um, in the future. Now, one of the biggest mistakes um, that practitioners that aren't trained in uh, elemental hair analysis is that they don't um, is that they read the levels at face values, as I said, meaning that if they see uh, high calcium, then they might evaluate this and say, well, a person has excess calcium in the body, so maybe we won't use it as a supplement or you should avoid anything that's high in calcium because honestly, it's often the opposite of that. <laughs> Usually when you find an elevated element, Oftentimes, not always, it does mean that you need to um, incorporate it in the person's nutritional uh, program because it's often seen as a loss or biounavailability or a compensation or a protective mechanism why it's elevated. Um, or you find something, you know, some an untrained practitioner might see uh, a very low iron level. And oftentimes, especially clients, they're always looking at iron because it seems to be the most common one that people know about. Um, but they presume that because their iron levels low, that they're likely anemic. And this can um, lead to some practitioners wanting to recommend iron supplementation, which might not actually be necessary. So, um, it does take some time to learn this and I don't want to, uh, you know, try and overcomplicate it, but oftentimes to, you know, you don't need to use a iron supplementation to improve an iron status in the body. Oftentimes you need copper or B vitamins, or, um, you need to improve the, uh, biochemical balance and nutritional cofactors so that iron can work better. Um, so please keep in mind that whether or not you have a high or low level on an elemental hair analysis, um, it doesn't automatically mean um, you have higher low levels in the tissues and that they can appear higher low for many different reasons. Um, very often, it's the case that we should supplement the thing that's ele elevated. Um, and oftentimes, you don't always need to supplement what's low. So trying to interpret mineral levels as they appear um, can kind of guide a clinical approach, but it's often inappropriate unless you're trained to do so, as it can lead to ineffective or possibly even harmful clinical results, because you might just keep loading someone up with iron, and the iron level might not move because that's not necessarily what iron indicates on a hair test. Now, I'm not saying this to like discourage anyone from using an elemental hair analysis, but instead to educate you on how um, how important it is to kind of get an understanding of the mineral data that we're reading about and what we're learning about um, so that we can use this information to properly interpret a hair test um, so that we can have it, you know, um, the optimal experience with it in our clinic. So elements interact together in a dynamic and a complex system. And you can see in this image on the right here, it's very complex. Um, and every time you supplement one mineral, it can it always has an effect on at least two other minerals. Um, it can raise or lower another mineral. Um, so you can see how complex it can get very quickly when it comes to just using isolated nutritional supplements like just selenium or just iron or something. Now, many practitioners approach hair test um, results by trying to um, 
you know, supplement what's low and all this kind of stuff. But um, this is really a form of what's called replacement therapy. And it can be helpful, you know, especially in the short period. But as far as like reaching the optimal results or reaping, you know, the most from a nutritional program, usually it's very limited in its approach. Um, we see really great results um, in our clients when they start to incorporate the mineral balancing science, um, which we do simplify things a little bit, but um, we won't have time to go too much into it today because um, it'll just be too much information. But I, I will say that clients can notice some benefits quite quickly, but it does take um, a lot of time to really improve a lot of chronic conditions um, because shifting tissue element status um, is not very quick. Um, just to raise selenium levels to say ideal, you know, levels, for example, can take up to nine months of taking it every single day. And that's like, you don't often want to go quicker than that, because if you take too high a doses of things and you can have negative experiences as side effects from doing so. So it does take a little while, but oftentimes you will notice improvements in your clients in the short period, while there's these longer lasting improvements in the long run as well. Now, the scope of what I can cover today it is quite limited. I'm trying to cover as much as we can today. Um, but I wanted to spend some time on ratios. And the reason why I wanted to spend time on ratios is because it has the most um, meaningful information as far as our um, integrating hair testing into our practice. Now, um, we need to remember that this information will uh, only be relevant for the hair samples that are being um, tested at labs that don't wash the hair. So please, <laughs> if you use a different lab that does wash the hair, um, I would honestly probably just disregard this information because it does will affect a lot of the electrolyte levels here. Now, the elemental ratios are um, amazing as far as, you know, a parameter for health. It um, is a very simple thing, really. You just it's a it's a very simple mathematical equation where you take um, two numerical levels of any two elements. So, um, for example, you can have a calcium level of a thousand parts per million and a potassium level of fifty parts per million. And if you divide these together, and you can find a calcium to potassium ratio of twenty. So it's very simple in its essence, like that. Now they're really important because. Um, in some ways, they're more important than the mineral levels themselves because they represent homeostasis of the body. They represent a homeostatic balance that the body is trying to keep over the period of the sample, um, so three to four months. Now, while most people focus on just single nutritional deficiencies, like, oh, you're deficient in zinc or magnesium, the, the truth of it is, is that um, individual nutritional deficiencies are quite rare. Um, what's more common is nutritional imbalances. So you can have relative deficiencies. Now, um, for example, as you can see illustrated on this diagram on the left here, that a um, when calcium, for example, when tissue calcium levels start to lower, this often increases magnesium tissue levels. And this can improve or contribute to an imbalance between calcium to magnesium, right? The ratio. Magnesium is a very potent antagonist to sodium. So taking magnesium can often lower sodium levels on a hair test, but this can also uh, have an, another effect on potassium. So it can raise potassium. And this is just one example of lowering one mineral to raise another mineral. You can manipulate the levels of calcium, for example, to improve the uh, the levels of potassium or sodium, whatever one, with the same kind of information. Now, this is just one example. And in actuality, each element will affect at least two minerals um, and two vitamins. And it kind of goes out like, you know, fractals. <laughs> but um, it get, just gets too complex to get into everything in this presentation. But we can still say in general that um, any imbalance between nutrients within the body contributes to a host of health problems that are still not fully understood today and only just becoming recognized in the literature. So learning about mineral ratios is um, a really important step in the right direction. 
Now, Lifeline Diagnostic tests for 29 different elements. And there are over 800 ratios possible because if you, you know, 29 times 29. Now, but having information from hundreds of ratios on a hair test does not mean more relevant information. So we're only going to talk about the six most significant ratios, um, the ones that have the most meaning in our practice. This is calcium to magnesium, calcium to potassium, calcium to phosphorus, sodium to potassium, sodium to magnesium, and zinc to copper. So remember when I said that, you know, elemental hair analysis can provide so many insights into multiple areas of the body. Well, as you will see, um, the six main ratios that I've just mentioned are the main providers of this information. Now, on the second page of the Lifeline Elemental Hair Analysis Report, you'll find that there's a table that includes um, significant element ratios. Now, I have added a column on the left here just to show a simplistic meaning of what these ratios indicate. Um, but Lifeline offers you um, the range that they consider uh, relevant to interpret the ratios. So the information on the right is just as is from Lifeline's uh, hair test report. Now in mineral balancing, we do use specific ideal levels and ratios, but I won't be going into all of this today. But for now, um, you can just use the norms that are found at the lab because these are still a really good starting point. The first ratio that I wanna talk about is the NAK ratio. And this is commonly called the vitality ratio, um, but really it reflects adrenal hormone status. It shows us the electrical potential of cells. And it, you know, this electrical potential is regulated by sodium and potassium levels. And these are two electrolytes. And it's to some degree related to the sodium uh, pump mechanism of the cell in current scientific thinking. But uh, this can be debated. Not everyone believes in the pump mechanism of the cell. Nonetheless, um, sodium and potassium, the balance is still very important. Now, sodium and potassium themselves are regulated uh, by hormones in the body, aldosterone for sodium and cortisol for potassium. Now, this may not always reflect with another type of test, but on a hair test, we find this to be the case. Um, both of these hormones are adrenal hormones. So sodium to potassium ratio and even the levels reflect adrenal gland hormones. The NAK ratio is, in my opinion, the most important ratio on elemental hair analysis. Um, so it's the, the, the element, if you could only focus on one to really improve, to substantially improve your client's health, it's this ratio. So sodium and potassium, as we said, are um, they reflect the glucocorticoids. They are um, two very synergistic elements. They're often found together in the body, um, and the balance between these two elements is very important. If these elements are imbalanced, it indicates important physiological disturbances of the cell. This is why it's a priority really to correct. Now, sodium is primarily an extracellular el element, while potassium is a, normally an intracellular element. So the balance is kind of like this inside outside dynamic here. Now the sodium potassium pump is found on most cell surfaces and it's powered by adenosine triphosphate. And this pump moves sodium and potassium ions in opposite directions. In a single cycle of the pump, three sodium ions are extruded and two potassium ions are imported into the cell. Now, the adrenal glands direct the kidneys' regulation of sodium and potassium levels, and often when one rises, so too does the other. So you'll find sodium and potassium levels often rise together. If the kidneys cannot regulate the NAK ratio, then there's an imbalance of these two elements. Um, so when there's an imbalance in the sodium to potassium ratio, um, hormones, you know, glucose, amino acids, medications even, it's not very easy for these things to get inside of the cell because this um, exchange is not working properly. Now, an imbalanced ratio 
of the, of the NAK ratio is often associated, therefore, with things like heart issues because of the electrolytic functions, um, kidney because the levels themselves regulated there, um, and liver, it can provide information on liver, like in liver inflammation, for example, um, and it can give us insights onto the immune system. Now, when the ratio is lower than two, um, the person is generally in a state of exhaustion. But um, if, say, the, the levels themselves are also low, then the exhaustion will be even more extreme. So you find this really commonly in people that have burnout, you know, or um, hypoadrenia, very low adrenal gland function. Now, um, the, if the sodium and potassium levels are high, and the ratio is low, we would say that this is a person that's experiencing um, a secondary acute stressor, um, which is increasing adrenal gland function. But because the NAK um, ratio is low, we would still say that they were already in a state of an exhaustion, but they had a secondary stressor. Now, when you have an elevated NAK ratio, and to me, this is over six, I think it's quite normal to see it somewhere between two um, and four, to be honest. So when it's higher than that, five, six, this generally indicates excessive inflammation. And this can be for many different causes. It's just very simple and open. <laughs> it's just inflammation. The next ratio is calcium to magnesium ratio. And this ratio gives us a picture of the cell's ability to metabolize carbohydrates. Whether it's you know um, a high or a low, this ratio, if it's high or a low, it can indicate an imbalance. And it's not always clear enough to suggest, oh, it's just high or low blood sugar. Um, it's simply just saying that there's an imbalance with the person's ability to metabolize carbohydrates. Now, calcium and magnesium are both um, necessary for keeping each other in a solution in their ionic state. So um, any imbalance between either or can cause some issues here. Calcium is primarily an extracellular element. Magnesium is that intracellular, and that's that inside-outside <laughs> dynamic again here. Both calcium and magnesium are just entangled with each other, um, and often they share sim uh, similarities and symptoms when one or the other is out of balance. Um, nowadays, it's a little more common to see people just using a lot of magnesium supplementation, but they often overlook that some of those symptoms, especially if they're not being relieved by magnesium, could be from a calcium imbalance. So calcium is required for the release of insulin from the pancreas, and magnesium inhibits this. It stops the secretion of insulin. So if you consider that insulin is you know, what a diabetic takes to lower their blood sugar level, calcium can therefore lower the blood sugar of a person. And um, magnesium is kind of like the stop switch. Both high and a low calcium magnesium ratios are um, very much correlated with the same kind of symptomatology. In general, it's just an impairment of glucose metabolism. Um, and this usually results in you know, functional hypoglycemia or low blood sugar or disinsulinism, which is unstable blood sugar, and hyperglycemia, or high blood sugar diabetes, right? Now, generally a high ratio is due to consuming too much carbohydrates and a low ratio is due to hypoglycemia. But I will say that this is not, it's just not that always that simple. <laughs> it's just not always the case. And you can have in individuals with prediabetes, for example, with low ratios. So don't just take it at face value and the diagnostic means, but use it to help guide what's going on with your clients. In addition, I a disturbance in the normal balance between calcium or magnesium can also result in muscle contraction or relaxation. So you can have um, oftentimes with a higher or low ratio here, muscle spasms, right? Even arrhythmias of the heart because the heart's a muscle. Now, an elevated calcium to magnesium ratio is um, also very well correlated with the coronary artery calcium score. And this is just a bonus of, you know, an elemental hair analysis is because it can help guide us down the road, which could be potentially life-saving for our clients, um, if you know how to use that information, of course. Now, um, this is especially the case with calcium because calcium at the tissue is correlated with tissue calcification. And so that's how we can get this information on the coronary artery calcium score. 
let's spend some time on zinc to copper. Now zinc and copper, um, this ratio is very difficult to limit to like a single meaning. It could be called the hormone ratio because, you know, um, progesterone and estrogen balance or testosterone and estrogen it could be the brain ratio, whether or not you're using primary neocortical function or the diencephalon it could be the heart ratio or even the infection ratio, but it's much more, um, it's much more relevant in my opinion, um, to use this ratio to evaluate, um, copper and zinc status more so than just the copper zinc levels themselves. So you will often find an elevated zinc to copper or a low zinc to copper. And this can give us indication of whether or not we want to use um, more zinc or more copper to help shift this ratio in the right balance. Now, both elements are related to the antioxidant activity of uh, superoxide dismutase, and that's a very potent <laughs> enzyme in the body and um, anti-inflammatory um, indicator. So getting a good balance of zinc to copper is very important, especially with people with chronic inflammation. Zinc, as far as um, hormones, it oftentimes correlates with progesterone, especially in women, but to some degree it can be as well in men. Um, but Zinc usually is correlated with testosterone in men. And it, it can technically also indicate that in a female. Um, copper is generally reflecting um, estrogen. And so we can often find that some people have imbalances, right? Estrogen is not just a female thing. You can have men that have higher estrogen levels than females and females with higher testosterone than men. And you can use a hair test to kind of figure this out a little bit. Um, now, what's most important is that there must be a balance between, you know, copper and zinc. When an imbalance occurs, then um, a person becomes more prone to infections. And this is very relevant in today's age, especially when everybody is taking excessive amounts of, say, zinc, because it can affect your copper status. Now, um, zinc is antiviral, while copper is, you know, more so antibacterial and antifungal, but it does have some degree of antiviral, um, but generally speaking, zinc is antiviral, copper is antibacterial, antifungal. When this ratio is elevated, so a high zinc to copper ratio, it often indicates a need for antifungals or increased copper intake to help um, improve the status here, or at least protect the person's immune status to you know, these microbial growths. When the ratio is low, so we say you know below 6.5, we often find that zinc is relatively low to copper, and this is common in individuals with a viral load such as Epstein-Barr virus, but also others as well. Um, it's um, also really common when it's a low ratio to find individuals that are estrogen dominant, and thus it could be um, very helpful to also consider this as far as using, say, diendol, uh, DIM or indole-3-carbonyl or sulforaphane or something to help, um, you know, <laughs> metabolize this excess estrogen a little bit better. The sodium to magnesium ratio on the hair test is the adrenal ratio. And we've already said that, you know, sodium on a hair test is associated with aldosterone and adrenal hormone, and this regulates sodium in the body. Now, the higher the sodium, we usually say the higher the aldosterone, at least at the tissue level. Now, sodium itself is a very volatile element, while magnesium is a relaxant. So the balance between sodium to magnesium are um, somewhat antagonistic. As one goes up, often the other goes down. So it's very common to find an imbalance between these, uh, at least on this ratio here. It often won't reflect, you know, perfectly blood or saliva tests because, you know, the latter uh, measure hormones or their metabolites in blood or saliva, but the hair test measures the cellular and tissue effect. So um, they usually don't correlate entirely. But you can find that they're, at least from what I've found, at least, Dutch tests can somewhat correlate to the hair test. So dried urine. Now, a, a hair, a high sodium to magnesium ratio, to, um, to me at least, is above eight. And this is um, indicative of hyperadrenia, so overactive adrenal gland function. 
it's not extremely common to find this in modern day, but you do see it, especially in individuals that had um, a, a lot of stress that's going on. Usually it's before their adrenal gland uh, function depletes. Um, you'll also find an elevated sodium to magnesium ratio in those sodium sensitive, you know, hyperten uh, hypertensive individuals. And taking advantage of knowing that magnesium is very antagonistic to that might be, hey, maybe magnesium might be helpful for this client to lower sodium. A low ratio indicates hypoadrenia or low adrenal gland function. And it's commonly found in those with magnesium retention in the cells. Now, this doesn't always mean that they don't need magnesium, um, but it just means that their tissues are somewhat elevated. And um, you can find that these individuals usually still have things like hypoglycemia, um, since cortisol is important for balancing blood sugar. So when you have low um, adrenal function, usually you're going to have blood sugar imbalances. And this is very common to find that low ratio and someone that just needs to eat every two hours. Otherwise, <laughs> they you know have increased symptoms. Now, the adrenal glands supply the fuel to the cells for the cellular energy production um, and it does this by raising blood sugar. So um, the cells can uptake this glucose and then use it to create adenosine triphosphate, right? Biochemical energy. So it, the adrenal function is very important as far as energy production. Now, the second last ratio here um, is calcium to phosphorus ratio. And this indicates the state of the autonomic nervous system. Um, this reflects the uh, different branches. And so calcium is more reflective of parasym this parasympathetic branch of the autonomic nervous system because calcium is somewhat um, relaxing and sedating and calming and numbing. But phosphorus usually reflects the uh, activity of the sympathetic branch of the autonomic nervous system because it's more <laughs> fiery, right? Um, it's more stimulating to the nervous system. A high calcium to phosphorus ratio is often due, at least in my experience, to inadequate at intake of calcium in the diet, and this can lead to bone depletion. Um, it's common for these individuals to have a pear-shaped body, so you know they're like bigger around the thighs, um, and these individuals often need more calcium and perhaps even more magnesium to help um, calm this excessive nervous system activity. So it helps kind of chill them out. It's the chill pills, right? And it does this um, when these individuals are often overstimulated, then you'll find that they have an excessive dorsal vagal complex dominance. So the, if you're into polyvagal theory, you'll know that they, there's an unhealthy um, parasympathetic dominance that can occur. And oftentimes they need something to calm them down because they're so stimulated and they get, get a little overactive. Now, a low calcium to phosphorus ratio is correlated with sympathetic dominance and an apple-shaped body, so they hold a lot more weight in their belly area. And you'll see individuals often like this in your practice. So now, phosphorus in a hair sample usually suggests protein and amino acid status, because that's usually where you find a lot of phosphorus in the diet. And inflammation uh, burns up protein because it breaks things down. So a decline or an elevation in this ratio can, um, can um, really af be affected when there's a lot of uh, protein destruction. And you'll usually find an elevated ratio here, ca elevated calcium to phosphorus ratio. So this ratio can, um, when it's elevated, especially usually indicate inadequate protein intake or even a vegetarian diet that's not really being um, utilized to its best ability um, so that you might need to either work on improving protein digestion or even limiting anti-acid uses and things like this because your body, it's indicating that the body's not breaking down this protein properly to rebuild the, the muscle in the body. You can also have like um, serious infections that affect this ratio or even um, you know more chronic health conditions. And it's usually just because these individuals are just run down. Um, now, the last ratio is the calcium to potassium ratio. This is the, um, the thyroid ratio. And this is one of the uh, really important ratio um, as far as hair testing goes. Um, so in mineral balancing, we identify calcium and potassium as um, two really important 
uh, elements that regulate the thyroid gland function. So calcium somewhat slows down the creation of metabolic energy, while potassium speeds it up. So cellular calcium can desensitize like the cell membrane. So um, it's like blocks the ability of the cell to receive thyroid hormone from the blood. So you often find elevated levels of hormones in the blood, but the cellular level is very low because they can't get in because of this calcification that occurs. Well, potassium increases the sensitization of the cell membrane and therefore increases this thyroid hormone uptake um, into the cell. So the better potassium levels, the more overactive thyroid you can actually have. Um, now for the thyroid gland to operate at its, you know, maximum capacity and its healthy capacity, there has to be a balance between these two elements. Now, if a person has too much calcium compared to potassium in the tissues, they will um, have an underactive thyroid gland at the cellular level. And this is a calcium potassium ratio greater than six. Now, in contrast, if a person is, has too much potassium relative to calcium in their tissues, they would have a low calcium to potassium ratio. So it would be below three usually. And this indicates an overactive thyroid gland at the cellular level. Um, now, we all know <laughs> thyroid affects many different uh, systems in the body, like digestion or cardiovascular health, or the ability to metabolize fats, carbohydrates, proteins, and affects you know body weight, heart rate, blood pressure, so many different things. So um, getting an understanding of this calcium potassium ratio can provide a lot of insights into helping our clients. Now, I will say that it often doesn't always correlate with the blood thyroid tests because hair is a tissue, um, but um, blood tests usually often indicate a normal thyroid status for most people unless their thyroid is really out of balance. Whereas an elemental hair analysis will often indicate an imbalance in the, um, the thyroid function before these blood tests will. And oftentimes you'll find these clients you know, come to you, they want their thyroid test because they have all the symptoms, but the blood test doesn't say anything. Well, oftentimes you'll find the hair test does, and you can start to address it before it becomes a big problem. And this is one of the major values of going to a functional medicine practitioner. Now, ratios can also be a really good indicator to assess an individual's progress. So, um, of course, you have to take, the, take into account, you know, <laughs> Um, the rest of the test as well, but, um, you know, including the levels, mineral levels, but, um, and symptoms, but oftentimes an improvement in ratios usually show an improvement in the person's metabolic functions and the homeostatic mechanisms. Now, I will say that very often you will have at least one ratio that looks worse. And this is kind of just the nature of the, the balancing process. When you start to work with things, it's, you're bound to have one or two ratios that look a little worse and they might person might feel a lot better. Um, but it doesn't usually indicate that a person is just worsening in their health or symptoms if this occurs. Um, another factor um, with a worsening of a ratio is that toxic metal elimination can um, skew the results on a test. And this is very common, for example, with like elevations of cadmium or mercury or copper. Um, and pretty much every other mineral, you know, can have an effect on other mineral status. But the ones I mentioned, cadmium, mercury, copper, iron, manganese, aluminium, nickel, these all can temporarily raise the sodium level on a hair test. And therefore, it can impact the NAK ratio, the sodium to potassium and the sodium to magnesium ratio. So that vitality ratio and that adrenal gland ratio. All right, so let's put some of this information together. Um, onto you know, what we're going to do is it on the example of the elemental hair analysis because I'm not going to share a live case study today but um, let's put it together on the um, the lifeline sample report here so if we look at the NAK ratio here we can see that the ratio is low um, it can indicates low adrenal gland function often chronic fatigue but not always um, and we can also assume that there's going to be a low hydrochloric acid function when this ratio is low so, you know, with this information, we can often say, hey, a low NAK ratio, there's probably immune compromisation or some dysbiosis, low hydrochloric acid function, low adrenal function or fatigue. And you could use this kind of information to gauge, hey, maybe we should be using betaine HCL or some sort of hydrochloric acid 
supplement to help improve this um, balance here. Now the calcium to magnesium ratio, we can see, you know, the ratio is too high, um, which often suggests that there's a relative magnesium deficiency um, and that the person may be consuming a little bit too much carbohydrates. Um, we might be able to also use this to indicate, you know, risk for coronary calcium, and we could suggest, you know, investigating this further with other testing especially if the calcium level itself is elevated. So if we look at the, you know, the levels, um, we can see that while this is outside you know, the normal reference range, um, the level is elevated, but I'll be honest, it can be way higher than this number here. And you can have it upwards of 2000 parts per million and even beyond, especially in individuals that are very fatigued. But calcium levels are a really good indicator of tissue calcium. And the higher the calcium level, the more difficult it is for nutrients, drugs, and even hormones to permeate the cell wall because it's calcified. It's like, you know, a crustacean shell protecting. Now, the more, um, more you, uh, calcified tissue, the more likely you'll find that glucose can't properly get into the cell. So you'll find that elevated blood sugar. We can also check the other levels of other elements that are known to be important for blood sugar metabolism, such as chromium, manganese, and even vanadium. And you can see that all these levels are low. So when we're working on correcting these elements to improve the person's carbohydrate intolerance, we can also see that, yeah, the calcium magnesium ratio is elevated, but also you need to work on the manganese, you need to work on the vanadium and the chromium. And these could be a means of supplementing these nutrients to help improve the person's carbohydrate tolerance. Now, the zinc to copper ratio for this individual, the norm at the lab says somewhere between you know, 6.4 and 9.6. We can see that this patient's result is 17. So this ratio is high. And this can indicate a relative copper deficiency. Now, copper may be... Um, an important supplement also because it can help improve a sodium to potassium ratio due to it being antifungal and antibacterial because those are properties of copper. And because supplementing copper itself can lower, um, sorry, supplementing copper itself can raise sodium on a hair test. So it can be a very important nutrient to use to help shift the body chemistry in the right direction. Now, low sodium to magnesium ratio usually suggests um, you know, low adrenal gland function. We've talked about this a couple, quite a few times with sodium and the importance of sodium as an adrenal glucocorticoid. So um, when we see the low uh, adrenal gland ratio here, we can also say, hey, this agrees with the findings that we found with the sodium potassium ratio where there's likely fatigue or even some exhaustion going on. Now, when you do find a low adrenal gland ratio, you can use this information to help provide, you know, maybe an adrenal glandular to help support the adrenal function in the body because and it's like helps like, or you can use a herb to help support the adrenal gland function to either stimulate um, the adrenal gland to kind of get the hormones working a little bit better here. You'll find that this, this um, calcium to phosphorus ratio on this, uh, this example client here is slightly elevated. It's not too far out of balance. Um, this can indicate an increased need for phosphorus. Because, um, so you might make a recommendation, hey, maybe more proteins needed. Of course, that we know they need digestive support. So we want to provide that digestive support to help break down that protein. Um, or you can use this information to say, hey, maybe... Um, there might be somewhat of a calcium deficiency that's causing the calcium to be elevated because of an overactive parathyroid gland function. Um, and in this case, you would say, hey, let's maybe use like calcium phosphate or some sort of calcium that provides uh, phosphorus as well to help normalize the parathyroid function. Now, if you recall earlier, I mentioned how you cannot always just look at an element level at face value. So calcium is an excellent example of this. Now, calcium levels on an elemental hair analysis is actually um, high, usually because of something called biounavailability. Um, so when there's a biounavailability of a nutrient, um, you can have elevated levels in some areas of the body, while it's low in other areas of the body. So elevated calcium on it 
uh, hair test often indicates buildup of calcium in the soft tissues. And the higher the calcium level, the more prevalent this tissue calcification is. So the calcium level appears um, high in the hair, but the person's bone is very likely being depleted uh, of calcium by a parathyroid hormone to maintain blood homeostasis. And the higher the calcium level on a hair test, the more you need to supplement with it. So it's counterintuitive in this way. Or at least increase dietary calcium, at least up into the recommended daily allowance, um, which is usually at least 1,000 to 1,200 milligrams of calcium um, to stop this compensation that's occurring because of the parathyroid. Um, now, to improve the body's ability to utilize, you know, calcium and make it more bioavailable, um, it's really important to also provide um, other nutrients than just calcium. Bones made up of 44 minerals. It's not just calcium, but calcium is a major part of it. Um, but we also want to provide nutrients like magnesium, sodium, and potassium. In some cases, vitamin K can also be very helpful, especially if a very high elevated calcium. But it's not always needed in my experience, um, but it, it can be used. Sometimes it can lower the levels a little too good <laughs> and cause um, low calcium status again on the hair test. Uh, B vitamins are also really important since um, one of the primary causes of tissue calcification is a cellular deficit of energy. So, you know, providing the nutrients that the cells need to create energy can be very helpful for improving tissue calcification. Now, um, on this uh, example here, we can also find that the calcium to potassium ratio is slightly high, um, and we can use this to identify the tendency for a low thyroid function, at least at the cellular level. And we might use this information to either provide some thyroid support or at least look at other elements which might affect the thyroid to see what's going on. So um, since we know, for example, that the thyroid is slightly under-functioning on the hair test, we would look at things like iodine and selenium levels. And we can use this to assess whether or not these may be missing links for the a healthy thyroid function. And we can see that um, iodine and selenium levels are both low, which correlates with the trend for hypothyroidism. And since you need iodine to make T4, you know, thyroid hormone and well, um, you know, you need selenium for the essential uh, function of converting T4 to the biologically more active, at least thyroid hormone uh, T3, then you can also see that there's other information that's suggesting, hey, there actually is a lower thyroid function here. And this might also encourage you to maybe do a blood test to see if it's also occurring on the blood. And then you can work with your client to, um, whether you use medication or not, that's between, you know, you guys, but um, at least you can use a hair test to kind of guide what's going on here. All right, we covered a lot already. Um, I think we're still okay for time, 14 minutes, is that right? I think so. So we're going to go into <laughs> the heavy metal detoxification and elemental hair analysis. So, um, so far, I briefly introduced the most important ratios on an elemental hair analysis. Now let's spend some the rest of this time together um, discussing one of the primary reasons that most practitioners use hair testing, and this is to assess heavy metals, um, you know, detoxification or heavy metal status. At the end of the, the, this um, presentation, I will share with you some of my favorite approaches to detoxifying metals as well. Now, toxins um, and inflammation usually function, you know, toxic metals and inflammation uh, usually function as oxidant catalysts. So they produce oxidative stress from, you know, free, um, free radicals and cell membranes, tissues, organs, this sort of thing. And as a result, it impairs cellular function, which has a whole host of effects. It can affect many different functions in the body. And um, this is by no means a comprehensive list. This is just a list that shows um, common indications of congestion and detoxification pathways, um, and even to some degree, a toxic element burden. Now, many toxins are fat soluble and affect us in uh, one or one of three ways. There's toxicologically. So if they affect our nerve and um, brain, so then they cause disorders. Um, and since many toxic elements are damaging to this sort of tissues, uh, immunologically, so allergies, 
autoantibodies or Hashimoto's kind of states, um, altered abilities of, of our immune function. So we might not be able to protect our bodies uh, enough from different infections like bacteria, viruses, and you know, candida, parasites, worms, whatever. Um, and it can also affect a healthy functioning of like our, of our cells. So you can also have rogue cells, right? Cancer kind of things come up as a result of toxic metal burdens. The other um, way that toxins can affect um, us is pathophysiologically. So they can impair kidney function or affect adrenal hormones or thyroid function, which then can have um, systemic effects in other areas of the body. Now, toxic elements are easier to detect in hair than in blood. And since they're not um, found in high concentrations in the blood, usually, unless you've just been exposed to like an acute exposure, then um, hair can be really meaningful for uh, assessing toxic metal status over a, a period of time. Now, toxic metals, just like nutritional elements, are still um, subject to the homeostatic functions of the body. So, um, the body oftentimes when it's exposed to these toxic elements tries to move them to locations where they do the least amount of damage, um, at least in the short term. So, um, so toxic elements that can't be eliminated um, usually exit the blood and accumulate in tissues, including the hair, because the body doesn't want it in the blood because it'll affect the heart. So it'll put it in an area where it's not going to cause as much harm. Now, heavy metals showing up on a hair test can indicate either a recent or um, a past exposure, in which case the metals that were um, previously stocked in the tissues were recently excreted. So you can have like, um, you might have been working on your nutritional status and you might find increased toxic metals on a hair test because they're coming out of the tissues, moving through the blood. And then you might find elevations just from a detoxification protocol, but you can also find it because of past exposures and even recent exposures. So if you just got exposed to a lot of arsenic or aluminum or something, you'll find the elevations on the hair. Now, many initial um, hair tests, the you know, meaning a first person, a person's first hair test, often show very little or even no metal um, excretions as far as toxic metals. And this doesn't necessarily mean that there's no uh, heavy metal burden in the tissues. Um, and but this is a common misconception. So when the toxic elements are too low, you should be um, suspicious. Am I uh, still presenting or? <laughs> I... Yes. Oh, yes. I... <laughs> Sorry, Johnny. The, yep. uh, Pablo needs to add me to this the conversation because we need to uh, go to the to the end of the presentation. So no just uh, two, two minutes more. More, okay. Two and uh, so Pablo, please, yeah, two, three minutes because we have the second part with Q and A. Okay, yeah, that's fine. I, that's fine, totally fine. Okay. Um, so uh, Pablo, please uh, uh, give uh, John opportunity to share the screen. <laughs> so we gotta fly by as quick as we can. That's okay. Uh, Okay, so yeah, oftentimes you'll find that their um, individuals don't have very high toxic metals. And this is usually because they don't have the energy or they don't have the nutrients to really detoxify these things. So once you begin nutritional supplementation, you'll often find an increase in toxic metals on the next hair tests. And this is a, usually a good sign as long as you're not having recent exposures to more toxic metals. 
Um, now, oftentimes people do use chelation therapy, but this can have a lot of negative effects on the body. Like, um, you know, if someone doesn't have open detoxification pathways, it can negatively affect the body or generally weaken them. Um, and the better way of kind of approaching this is by using nutritional um, support to really help open up detoxification pathways, improve cellular function, and even antagonize the function um, at the cellular level and block the absorption and this kind of thing. We use something called biological replacement of elements. And this is basically that the body prefers nutrients over toxic metals. So once you provide what the body needs, it'll let go of what it no longer needs. Um, and it's a very natural uh, approach to detoxification. Now, oftentimes you'll find, for example, um, calcium and lead being displaced by each other. So um, this is just one common example and why we can find people having a depletion of bone and then a buildup of things like toxic metals of lead um, that start to accumulate in the bone. Now, when a, um, we, we really start to improve a person's body with nutritional functions, uh, with nutritional supplementation, um, we will usually find toxic metals start to come out and therefore um, usually we say it's either being released from the bone or from the tissues um, and oftentimes you can have negative um, symptoms that occur as a result of using a nutritional program. Now this is a, a wheel that I put together um, and this is um, basically to outline simple nutritional antagonisms that are backed by clinical studies, you know, things that are freely available on PubMed. Um, and you can use this information if you find your clients are high in toxic metals. Um, you can use them to uh, shift the body chemistry in the right way. So if someone has a lot of lead, you can use selenium or vitamin C or even iron to block this lead um, in the body. And it works in this way. And you can find this on our website, um, mineralbalancing.org. So that concludes our presentation. <laughs> so if you're interested in learning more about hair testing, I offer a lot of free information on mineralbalancing.org. And of course we have our podcast on YouTube. Um, we also um, you know, use a lot of this information in our own practice. So I know that it is very meaningful and um, I would like to thank everyone for watching us and I'm happy to answer some questions if you guys have them. <laughs> Thank you very much, John. Uh, it was a great presentation. I think uh, I'm sure it was the first step uh, to get uh, to know a little bit more uh, about the hair tests. So thank you very much. And now we will go to the Q&A session uh, with Dr. Musa. So Dr. Musa, please uh, join us and uh, provide this part. Yes, thank you very much. If you allowed my video to share. Okay, thank you very much, uh, John, for a presentation. It was a very interesting, scientific, and beautiful presentation about hair minerals and mineral toxicity as such. Thank uh, you. We have a few questions from the audience, and that question is, I would like to categorize questions. Some questions are how to collect the sample. Some questions are depend uh, indications of hair mineral analysis testing, and certain questions are from clinical implementation or protocol, something like that. So I would like to start with the question, uh, as you mentioned that, you know, uh, we have to collect the hair sample. So somebody is asking the question that, can we collect a hair sample that is already lost? So example, somebody having a hair loss and we can collect the lost hair as a sample or we should, we should take a new okay. fresh sample. So, um, the, the, there's a big challenge with this. So if you use lost hair, it can be often very long and it's hard to tell which side was the area closest to the scalp that was lost. So it, it wouldn't provide the best information in my opinion to use hair that's been shed. It's best to use the hair that's closest to the scalp that you know and cut the sample 
you can grow your hair nice and long and it can be very, you know, <laughs> lovely and still do hair testing. And I know this because my wife had her hair very long and she does testing regularly. Um, but the best way is to just keep that testing means, in the same spot. That means, yeah, that means you have to collect and fresh hair sample. That is the best way to go for testing. Also, somebody is asking the question, like, you know, uh, if somebody using a swimming pool that contain a chlorine, so how long, how often uh, uh, we have to wait before we collect a sample? Um, so for chlorine, swimming, uh, yeah, chlorine or uh, somebody is using a swimming pool that affect the results of uh, analysis, or we have to wait for a certain time, then we collect a sample. I don't think that it would really connect uh, affect any levels that are tested at Lifeline. I think it can affect levels that you know if they were tested for for chlorine maybe one day they will um, <laughs> test for these noble, you know, elements. But um, as it, what you're more likely to find is sometimes people use things like um, uh, copper in the, in the pools and that can definitely contaminate the sample, but I wouldn't worry about just chlorine. Um, but if you have a high copper level, you might want to investigate to see if that's the culprit. Cause no matter how much washing you do, it will, it's contaminated. <laughs> It'll always just be high. Yeah. And also another question from my side is if we have, we have to wash the hair with water before we collecting a sample or it's just an any time we can collect a sample. As you mentioned that we should not use a medical shampoo, I know, but is the simple water cleaning of the hair is essential or it's an, just an optional part? Your mic is new. John, you are in mute. There we go. Sorry, I yeah, yes. muted. I shouldn't have. Um, did you say the question again? <laughs> I was panicking because I muted myself. Is just uh, washing the hair with simple water is required, or is just optional part? Um, and we typical, can water, yeah, the typical water does work. Um, you can, have, if it depends how picky you are, you can have, you know, hard water and soft water or even water that's gone through a so water softener. Those can impact the results. Um, more often the, the, the water softener I find does, but you can, it, it can impact the results, especially if you are wondering why you have a high calcium and you can't seem to get it down. You might want to consider that. Um, the best way really is distilled water or like reverse osmosis water, chemically pure water. Um, but when you work with clients, usually the harder it is to do the sample, the less likely they're going to want to do it. So, yeah. Yeah. So best way is to not clean the hair and just in the morning, once you wake up, just collect the hair. That's it. it, it like samples better that, to have it. And even if it might have some contaminant, you can always ask them, hey, do you have calcium buildup in your kettle or something? And if they do might be the common source for the calcium. And so another question is from clinical indication of this kind of testing. So as you mentioned in your slide that sometimes the result doesn't, affect, doesn't reflect the body status of the minerals, like you mentioned in the calcium. So what are the indication, real indication where we you know just go for uh, this kind of testing? Um, testing? So, so it just in general, it can be very helpful, but um, the more you learn, usually the more complicated things get, right? Um, so um, very often you can take them at not entirely face value, um, but you, you if you find an elevated level with calcium or something, I definitely could, would consider that to be an elevation. Um, with things like potassium or magnesium, you, sometimes you need to do some questions to see if there's a reason why some of these elements might be appearing elevated because of a stressor, like sodium, for example, or a loss of potassium because of stress or a loss of magnesium or zinc. They can be elevated and when the person actually needs some. So usually they're the stress-related elements, magnesium, zinc, sodium, potassium are the most common ones that you would kind of want to question for the uh, face value one. Yeah. But zinc copper, uh, zinc, sometimes it can be elevated because of stress, copper, manganese, those things are usually, um, you can take at face value, but thanks for asking that question. It's a good one. 
<laughs> so john regarding your opinion it is more of a nutrition that we are we should look at the herb analysis or it's a more of a heavy metals or toxicity that we should look at herb mineral tissue testing it, it's best to look at the, at the test as a whole really because mm -hmm. we're a whole human um but you can use information to get other information so if you find an elevated mercury and then you wonder why a person has a low thyroid function maybe there's a connection and then conveniently the body is very uh, forgiving in that something that would help the thyroid would also help eliminate mercury like copper or selenium or something right so um you know if you're trying to get the most information look at the ratios um, and then even compare a nutrient level and a toxic metal together so if you have a very low calcium to lead or something that might be an indication hey there's a big lead issue um, but you know usually you can just look at the ratios and get a lot of information yeah so in, in my clinical experience, we see a lot of patients with a high calcium and also the high lead level, and they, they usually have hypertension. So we have seen many correlation between the clinical presentation like hypertension with a high level of calcium and also they are lead toxic. Do you find any correlation yeah. with hypertension and high calcium or lead level? Um, well, lead, I did mention in the presentation how lead can increase adrenal function and therefore it can raise sodium levels and then cause some correlations there with the sodium. Um, so I, I do, um, to be honest, <laughs> we are, it's very common to find any toxic metal really to stimulate the effect on the sodium level, especially because they can have stimulating effects like cadmium, all of this stuff. Um, that's why people love cigarettes and coffee and why not? <laughs> That's right. Nowadays, we are, we are exposed to more often toxins in every diet, atmosphere, air pollution, water. You know, we are exposed to this kind of toxins. So really, this answers the question. And you are also mentioned beautifully about the, all the ratio, like and you mentioned sodium potassium, sodium calcium, and all the ratio. They are clinically significant with some kind of functions of the body, like adrenal function, all the functions you had mentioned. Now, uh, really question is when we find out uh, any kind of uh, toxic metal that is high, for example, let's say somebody is asking in a uh, group that uh, his son is having a high aluminum. So do you, uh, do you have any idea, you know, how we should start uh, treatment? Like, you know, we have to give yeah. an, any kind of detoxification approach or any kind of chelating agent or first we should start in like in minerals, we have to balance the mineral and then we can touch the toxicity. And it's also right, yeah. on clinical management of toxicity. So the first step is always trying to reduce exposure. That's the number one, obviously. But sometimes you can't. Aluminium, it's everywhere. Laptops are made out of it. Drink everything. You add it to water to make it sparkle better. You know, so it, it it's <laughs> prevalent. So this is where nutrition becomes very important because nutrients aren't just needed to help eliminate them from the body. They're also needed to block the absorption and block the function of them at the cellular level. So um, they're important for all the steps <laughs> as far as toxic metals, how they work in the body. So the first thing is, regard any heavy metal, look at increasing nutritional status in general. But then you will find that certain minerals or certain um, supplements have an affinity for certain toxic metals. Like zinc is very good for cadmium or selenium and mercury or selenium and arsenic, calcium and lead. Um, but when it comes to aluminum, aluminum is like, to be honest, one of the easiest ones to eliminate. You're usually going to find it elevated because as I said, it is everywhere. But the best thing to use in my experience is um, well, calcium, dietary calcium blocks absorption, but boron very cost effective, very simple to make, <laughs> even as a supplement. Um, you can use borax. Boron is very effective at getting aluminium out of the body, especially in neurological tissue. Yeah, that's, that's very nice. So we can use in nutrition or uh, other minerals to block the heavy metals and these things. And you had uh, also, so all the audience, there is information in his website. So you can look at the uh, mineral competition and all the other information yeah. if you are looking to further study or further read and learn about the metal toxicity mm -hmm. thank you very much and the last question i would like to address here is uh, when you talk about the detoxification do you think that we have to correct the digestive digestive system or gut 
when we are thinking about okay. the detoxifying any kind of minerals yeah you, you know i think everyone just says you have to heal the gut that's what everyone says <laughs> and no matter what it is you work on the gut it's a naturopathic principle to do that um the thing is is it's not that simple just to say work on the gut because you need minerals to help improve the function but then you also need a good gut to digest the minerals so it's a kind of like two hands that are connected um so what we like to usually do is say look even if you have malabsorption issues or anything provide the nutrients, give the body a chance at least, <laughs> don't just deprive them. If you need to work on gut, improving gut health, of course, address it with, you know, whatever you find works in your practice. There's many different uh, perspectives on this. Um, and as the gut health starts to improve, then the body will start to absorb these minerals a lot better. Now, some things like zinc are really important for hydrochloric acid production. Um, and Therefore, you need to provide the minerals. And I think that's a missing connection when it comes to improving gut health is you do need nutrients for it to work. Um, so I like to provide them. And sometimes, especially people with like um, really poor absorption, um, sometimes you have to provide more initially than you normally would because you know they're only going to get 20% of it, right? Yeah, John, thank you very much. That answer all the questions. And thank you very much for joining Indian Association of Functional Medicine. So, Marcin, last question people are asking is how to get this test done in India? So, if you can share your number or information <laughs> about that, thing, that would be really um, helpful for all the audience. You know, they want yeah. to go for the testing. You, you, yeah, the best place, as far as I know, for India, especially, is uh, Lifeline Diagnostics. Um, I know I've had issues in the past with the people that live in India to do hair testing because they don't like to send the samples out of the country and stuff. So um, I would talk to Marcin. I think he would be the best person to get this. Um, of course, you can always reach out to us at mineralbalancing.org, but I think Lifeline is the place to go for this. Yes, I just wrote yeah, uh, my yeah. email and WhatsApp number uh, on the, the chat, so you can uh, contact directly with me and uh, we'll give you all needed information about how to collect our samples or what is the price, etc, etc. So just feel free to contact directly with us. Uh, and yes, so guys, thank you very much. It was a great honor to have all of you. Uh, here on uh, our meeting, uh, Dr. Musa, thank you very much so for helping in uh, organize this uh, webinar and be a host in Q and A uh, session. John, thank you very much for your lecture for your for your presentation. It was uh, great knowledge for all of us, and uh, I hope that uh, we'll do it again in near future because there's a lot of knowledge to. <laughs> To, to tell people and I think it was really it, it will be really really helpful for all of us so thank you very much thank you for your time for for be with us and see you in our next meetings and webinars thank you very much thank you for having me thank you very much have a good day bye 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 bye, -bye.